Howdy! In today's discussion, we're going to talk about the gestalt that arises from collections of neural pathways that work together to accomplish specific functions in the central nervous system. Remember what gestalt means. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Today, we finally get to start seeing what all these neurons and pathways we've been learning about do when they work together in ways that you can really recognize in your day-to-day -day life. For this lesson, we're going to learn about several different major brain areas that allow you to operate and live, as well as areas that allow you to manage conscious and unconscious decision-making and interactions with the world around you. As you hear about what each of these brain structures is designed to do, I want you to also think about the kinds of deficits you might expect to see in a person who sustains damage to that structure or for whom that structure is abnormally developed. We'll start with the oldest parts of the brain which are shared by humans and many non-human animals. These are the essential parts of the brain that are responsible for life support and sheer survival. First, the medulla. This structure is part of the central nervous system that controls life support systems such as heartbeat and respiration gotta have this. Next is the reticular formation. This tiny structure has a huge job. It allows you to focus on and pay attention to the important stimuli around you while allowing you to consciously ignore or block out other interfering stimuli. This ability is critical for things like driving and studying. Now it's very important to understand that your brain is taking in and processing billions of bits of information at any given moment. The vast majority of this information is being processed outside your conscious awareness. There's just no way you can possibly deal with all of the stuff your brain is doing at any given moment. Instead, the reticular formation allows you to select the tiny fraction of things you're capable of paying attention to at one time. Ideally, you'll use this ability to pay attention to the most important things going on so you can make the best decisions, the fastest decisions, and accomplish whatever your goal is for that moment. However, the cost of selective attention is that there are tons of things going on around us that we fail to notice. You should know that these things we don't notice never enter our conscious awareness. Because of that, of course, first of all, we don't even know we didn't notice them. And also, we can't create a memory for them. This means that, as far as we're concerned, all the things we are not selectively attending never happened. This is one of the reasons eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. We'll talk about that more when we get to the memory material. It also means that we can be present during some event, such as a lecture, hint, hint. But if we're not selectively attending that information, say we're daydreaming about what we're going to do on our date tonight, then we won't remember the information at all. Bad deal. Okay, I want you to pause this lecture for a minute and click on the YouTube link. It's a very interesting and compelling demonstration of the value and the cost of selective attention, and it'll make it crystal clear to you how selective attention works, and how so many events can happen right in front of us, and we'd never even know it. The cerebellum is another older survival-based part of the brain. It does lots of things, but for our purposes, I want you to be aware of its role in muscle coordination control and motor programs. These are actions that we carry out, usually without ever having to think about them consciously, thereby saving our very limited selective attention resources. A good example of this is walking. You don't have to think about how to do it. You can just walk around, paying your conscious attention to something else, like having a conversation. It's kind of like doing activities on autopilot. As long as nothing unexpected crops up to interfere with your walking, like a giant mud puddle or a hole in the ground or traffic, your motor program works just fine without your conscious attention. Now we move on to the limbic system. This is a very important collection of structures responsible for your basic instinctual emotions and drives. Sometimes students refer to the limbic system as the home of the four F's. Fleeing, biting, feeding, and mating. These are inborn genetically coded activities that happen without your conscious effort. And this is important to understand. Emotions and drives happen whether you want them to or not. You can't control them happening, but as humans we do have cortical brain structures, we'll talk about in a minute, that allow us to have some control over the way that we behaviorally respond to those drives and emotions. For example, you can feel terrible anger and aggression towards someone, but you can choose to control your behavioral response and not hit them. 
Now the thalamus is an important executive assistant type structure, square in the middle of your brain. Sometimes it's considered part of the limbic system, so I'm telling you about it here. The reason it's sometimes not considered limbic is because it isn't really responsible for the creation of emotions and drives per se. Rather, the thalamus is the brain's clearinghouse for information. This is the brain structure that collects all the sensory info sent in by the PNS and then distributes that information to the correct part of the brain for further processing. It's the go-between, the middleman. It pre-sorts information to help the other parts of the brain be more efficient. Okay, now back to the limbic system proper. The first limbic structure we're going to talk about is the hippocampus. Interesting and important dude. The hippocampus is responsible for your ability to create new explicit memories. Explicit, in this case, means memories you can consciously recall over time and that you can talk about and describe. A good trick for remembering what explicit means is to think of it as a memory you can explain. See that? Explicit, explain, they start with the same sounds. We'll learn about other kinds of memories later in the memory chapter. A memory sneak peek I'll give you now is something called a mnemonic. Mnemonics are tricks for helping you remember something long term. I have a mnemonic for you to remember what the hippocampus does. Now work with me on this. Think about the word hippocampus. The first part is hippo, a giant gray pachyderm. And what's another giant gray pachyderm? Yes, an elephant. And what are elephants known for? Memory. Yay! Now, when you see the word hippocampus, it's going to trigger the definition memory. Cool, right? So mnemonics don't have to be super elegant or clever. They just have to work. Twenty years from now, when you hear some report and they mention the hippocampus, you're immediately going to know that has something to do with memory. Whoop. The next limbic structure is the amygdala, which is responsible for the basic emotions of fear and aggression. Now, I have a mnemonic for this one, too. Let's walk through it together. Work with me. I call this one the Oh My God mnemonic. So, let's say someone does something that really angers you and makes you feel aggressive toward them. And you might respond with, Oh My God! Or someone does something, jumps out from around the corner and scares you, and you respond with, Oh My God! fear. So now look at the word amygdala. Notice the my, my, and gd, god, there in the middle of the word. So now every time you see or hear the word amygdala, you can automatically remember the oh my god mnemonic about fear and aggression. And you'll know that the amygdala is involved in those emotions. <laughs> The last limbic system structure I'll tell you about is the hypothalamus. Like its big brother, the thalamus, the hypothalamus is a kind of executive assistant middle manager. But in the hypothalamus case, the information it controls is motivational drives that are regulated by hormones. Things like body temperature, sleep, hunger. The hypothalamus controls the endocrine system, telling it when to turn on and off. And the endocrine system controls your hormones. So ultimately, the hypothalamus controls hormone expression and therefore how extremely we feel these motivational drives. And finally, we get to the cortex. This is the seat of humanity. This is the part of your brain that separates you from other animals. There are far more neurons in your cortex than anywhere else in your brain. And this is the place where higher thinking and executive decisions happen. This is where you exert control over your emotions and drives, where you make plans, where you understand language and jokes, and where you make sense of the world. The cortex has several different specialized areas called lobes. We've already talked about a couple of these briefly. The frontal lobe, personality, speech production, and the temporal lobes, language comprehension. Now let's learn a little bit more. In each side of the brain's cortex, you have four lobes, each functionally specialized for thinking about a specific type of information. The two frontal lobes are the most complex. You already know this is the seat of personality. So you can use that to make sense of the kinds of thinking related to personality that the frontal lobes are responsible for. Judgment, planning, decision making, impulse control. You also already know the frontal lobes are involved in the motor movements involved in talking. 
Well, it turns out the frontal lobes have an entire subsection devoted to processing motor commands that get sent out to the somatic PNS. Remember, that is the peripheral nervous system that carries out muscle activities that are voluntary. Next in the cortex are the two parietal lobes. These are primarily involved in locating things, including where you are among those things. We call this spatial reasoning in general, and part of what this does is allow you to get from one pace to another and to use mental maps, which are sort of your internal nav system. The parietal lobes also includes a specialized subarea called the somatosensory cortex. Similar to what the frontal lobes do with the motor cortex, the parietal lobes house the part of your cortex that processes and starts making sense of all the sensory signals gathered by your somatic PNS about your body. The last two types of cortical lobes are devoted to processing your sense of vision and your sense of hearing. First, the occipital lobes, located in the very back of your brain, contain the visual cortex that decides what it is the sense receptors in your eyes are seeing. In the next chapter, Sensation and Perception, we'll talk in more detail about how this very complex series of events converts neural impulses from your retina into meaningful vision. Since there are two entire cortical lobes devoted to vision, you can probably guess that the sense of vision is one we, as humans, depend on quite a bit to interact with our world. Likewise, the sense of hearing is critical to the human condition, and it has its own two lobes devoted to it. These are the temporal lobes, conveniently located underneath your ears. You already know from our discussion about Wernicke's aphasia that the temporal lobes are involved in understanding language but they're also responsible for interpreting and making sense of all our other sounds, such as music. We'll talk a bit more about auditory processing in the Sensation and Perception Chapter 2. Okay, so the last item in this lecture. Now that you know how neurotransmission works, and you know what the different pathways in your nervous system do, you're ready to understand something called the Law of Specific Nerve Energies. What this law dictates is what I've already been telling you about, how what you perceive as real is whatever your brain tells you is real, and everything your brain tells you is its own interpretation of reality. This law simply explains that you will perceive something only in the way that the particular neural pathway carrying the neural impulses can perceive it. You had a glimpse of this already when we talked about ESB causing patients to respond with some perception whenever their cortex was stimulated with a mild electrical current. Likewise, any stimulus that can create an impulse in a neural pathway will cause you to perceive something that neural pathway interprets. So, neural impulses interpreted by your visual cortex will cause you to experience visual perceptions, regardless of whether the stimulus was actually visual. For example, if you press your fingers against your eyelids, not too hard, you will see something that looks kind of like fireworks. If you get hit in the side of the head, it will stimulate your auditory cortex, and you'll hear a ringing sound. Okay, great, that's mildly interesting. What's more interesting is how this helps us understand what's going on with folks who have hallucinations. If we use fMRI, one of the hemodynamic brain imaging measures we talked about before, to look at the brain of a schizophrenic while he's experiencing voices, we'll see that his temporal lobes, particularly Wernicke's area, are as active as yours are listening to my words right now. Point being, to the person who hears voices, their brain is telling them the voices are real. They are every bit as real to that person as my voice is to you right now. Wow, right? Thanks and gig em.